Hi, this is Ryan at Clovis Star. It's February 9th, 2016. I'm talking tonight about the incident in Hardy County, something that's been on my mind a lot lately. Uh, this one hits close to home for me in a lot of ways. Um, and not that I'm a rancher. I did come from a ranching family. Um, I had a, a couple of horses, you know, in our marriage, and my father had horses and cows, but um, I'm not a rancher. I, I wish I was a rancher. I would love to be a rancher. Um, and that's my heritage. And the issue, the conflict uh, that killed Lavoie Finnegan, uh, Robert Lavoie Finnegan, um, is an issue that reminds me of what happened in my Mormon history. Now, I'm formerly Mormon. I left the Mormon church. I resigned my membership, I don't know, like nearly 20 years ago now. It, it actually has actually been 20 years ago uh, that I resigned my uh, membership with the Mormon church. So this doesn't you know, this isn't a religious crusade for me. I, I have no religion, um, but I have a, a history, um, you know, a heritage that I'm interested in. I've always been into genealogy and, and ancestry, and I think this is fascinating. Um, so a few things about Hardy County that maybe people don't understand and how it connects the people that are protesting um, and the county itself and, you know, how all that in history links up. So Harney County is named after William S. Harney, uh, who was a military officer, eventually became a general of the Union Army. And this is a speck of the incident that happened in Utah in 1857-1858 with the Utah War, or Buchanan's blunder, as they call it. Uh, President Buchanan said that the Mormons were in rebellion because they weren't meeting the standards of marriage that the government wanted them to meet. They didn't approve of polygamy. And because the Mormons wouldn't give up polygamy um, and they had been ran out of Missouri, uh, Governor Boggs had issued an extermination order in Missouri to kill all the Mormons and a lot of the Mormons fled to Utah. And in Utah, you know, they still continue to practice their polygamy. So uh, President Buchanan sent uh, 2,500 troops in 1857 to uh, greet the Mormons with basically threats of, of uh, overthrow of their territory. Um, and so the uh, conflict kind of came to a head where uh, it peacefully ended without any shots being fired, not directly anyway. Uh, there was about 150 casualties and this is something I've reported on in the past, is the Mountain Meadows Massacre, where the Mormons killed a bunch of uh, uh, migrants that were coming to California, a bunch of uh, pioneers, and they were crossing the plains of southern Utah. And the Mormons confused them with the military that was coming out to kill them, um, the 2,500 troops. So the Mormons slaughtered these people, stole all their uh, cattle and, and gold and weapons and uh, and just killed everybody, the women, the children, the men, everybody died, about 120 people. And uh, it's one of the main things that stirred my heart to research the Mormon church, to get into what the depths of the Mormon church and history is, um, and, and why in the end I uh, ended up leaving the Mormon church. Um, you know, there was a lot of reasons for it, but that was a big one for me. That was what sparked a fire in my soul to learn more about the Mormon history is learning about the Meadow, uh, Mountain Meadows Massacre. So anyway, um, William S. Harney was provisioned as the general of these troops that were to lead them to Utah, and then eventually it was assigned to a different general. Um, as you can see here, uh, William S. Harney uh, had to stay because of the affairs with Bleeding Kansas. Um, which was another crisis with different militia and, um, you know, pro-slavery, anti-slavery people um, at the time. So he stayed behind and it was delegated to Colonel Albert Sidney Johnson. The troops were given to him to lead out to Utah. And they stayed there for like something like a year. And uh, some of them died of uh, hypothermia, uh, hypothermia, starvation and things like that when they were stationed. Um, but the whole premise was to restrict these people from their religious freedom to go out there and say no your first amendment rights don't actually count you can't practice your religion despite that polygamy has been an ongoing tradition in history for 
thousands of years, probably as long as written history existed. You know, it it long outdated any uh, colonists coming to the United States from Europe. So the uh, the you know connection there is that Harney County was named after the general that was supposed to lead the troops into Utah to slaughter the Mormons for being in a rebellion. And I thought that was kind of interesting that it was the Mormons that ended up coming. Okay, my baby ended up needing me, so she's going to make the video with me. Um, so anyway, it was interesting, the connection there between Harney County and then the original general that was supposed to go out there and slaughter the Mormons. Um, and then how the Mormons are in Harney County, and then the feds come in and they slaughter them. <laughs> you know, again, this is an ongoing thing where, you know, the government doesn't approve of Mormons, whatever they are doing, uh, for whatever reason, whether they're harming somebody or not, which in this case they're not. And back in the 1850s, they were not. You know, they were peacefully minding their own business. And then here comes the feds and they come and shoot them. Uh, or try to shoot him anyway back in this war and with uh, Lavoie Finnegan it ended up being pretty brutal and they did shoot him so I just thought that was an interesting uh, connection um, so you go into um, all of the history of this and Lavoie Finnegan has made videos and I, I, I encourage you to see them they're interesting in that he talks about these grazing rights and you know who owns the grazing rights and whatever. So the uh, uh, history is is that these grazing rights were established a long time ago. You know, over 200 years ago, and uh, well, not quite 200 years ago, but but cl uh, closing in on 200 years ago, when uh, these rights and claims were made, and deeds were given, and they were honored by the United States, and um, you know they were passed from one person to the next, and you know, Lavoie Finnegan bought his deed from somebody else, and somebody else bought it from the uh, person that owned it before him, and then they bought it from the person that originally made the claim. All of this was legitimate until the uh, uh, Taylor Grazing Act passed in 1934. And so this Taylor Grazing Act, um, I hear, you know, trumps any rights, any claims, or any deeds that anybody has, which that doesn't make any sense to me. And I've been listening to a constitutional attorney, her name's Chris Ann Hall, and she explains this, um, you know, that there are two things in the Constitution that define what the federal government can own for property, for land, and that's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, and Article 4, um, Section 3. And the, um, the two basically define what the federal government can own, and they have enumerated uses for, for land that must eventually be released to the people aside from forts and ports and 10 miles around Washington, D.C. And that's only if the states grant those, uh, those land uses to the federal government. And at any time, the states can refuse those land uses and take it back from the federal government. But they are for um, uses of enumerated um, value, which, you know, is defined in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. I had someone today tell me that, you know, before uh, the United States government bought that land, it was uh, Mexico. And so the Mormon pioneers actually settled it before the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, which is when the United States bought parts of Mexico. And so before that, um, purchase was made, Mormons had already claimed and settled that land and made agreements with, you know, natives and immigrants that had came from Mexico and settled places and things like that, that, um, you know, they had uh, the rights to those lands. They made trades and, and deals with those people before the United States ever bought that land from Mexico. So the Mormons were there predating the Utah Territory in 1847. But in February, uh, 2nd of February, 1848 is when that treaty was established. And then um, it goes forward. So these these claims and these deeds existed before that territory became a U.S. territory, and it was owned by these Mormon folks. And these Mormon folks had you know valid claims and deeds. So you know it, 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 first of all, you know if you listen to Chris Ann Hall, she's a constitutional attorney. She's a former prosecutor. She she knows her stuff. You know she's a, a professor and educator. Um, now she does a lot of blogging. She's, she's pretty amazing, and I love to hear what she has to say. I don't believe she's a Mormon. She's just 
somebody very educated on the Constitution, and she's addressed this issue in Harney County and with the other ranchers in Nevada and Arizona and Utah, you know, and around the, the rest of the United States that they're having this issue come up. So, so that's the point that I wanted to make is that the Mormons that went and claimed and settled that area and made trades with the natives and, you know, they were all, you know, in, in uh, cahoots. The Paiutes actually helped participate in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. The Mormons and the Paiutes made an agreement and the Paiutes actually led the charge. And so they were friends and they had made deals and, you know, they were... Um, in an alliance together so it's not like the mormons came and just stole the indian land or whatever you know they actually had made some trades and deals with them and and the land became theirs you know legitimately morally and ethically the, the mormons land in 1847. so predating any treaty predating any territory of the united states predating any of that these mormons owned that land and those deeds were solid before um, the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo so um, beyond all of that, um, I wanted to describe the uh, conflict there in Harney County. Uh, what is amazing to me is that um, LaVoy Finnegan, Ammon Bundy, the rest of them went out and met with the FBI, shook their hands, let them know there's a peaceful protest going on. There was no violence. There was no intended violence. They were peaceful people. And then uh, they did that little blockade on the road, you know, when they went up to meet the sheriff uh, in Grant County. And they uh, stopped the, the cars that were driving down Highway 395, which, in fact, we owned a business on that stretch of highway not long ago in California. Um, but uh, just a tidbit. But anyway, so they, um, they stop them and they start firing on the car, you know, and, and in that video that uh, aerial video, um, you know, they talk about how Ryan Payne got out of the car and then was arrested in that FBI video that said that is said to be unedited, um, doesn't show Ryan Payne getting out of the car and getting arrested. So clearly they edited that. But the point is, is that they were firing at the car before the car ever got stopped at the second stop. And, uh, when they reached their hand out to surrender, you know, and Ryan Payne popped his head around the corner and reached his hand out, they tried to fire off a shot and kill him and they missed him. So they almost killed Ryan Payne uh, before they even, you know, got out of the car, before there was any kind of, you know, uh, exchange there, um, words or otherwise, they were firing on those people uh, that were peaceful, that were traveling without any intent of harm, and, uh, you know, that were just basically uh, protesting the government and going to meet with the government. They actually had a meeting set up with the FBI and the sheriff of Grant County. So they were being very peaceful, very diplomatic. And uh, there was no need for them to fire on those people. So then Lavoie Finnegan gets out, and you can see in the aerial video that, you know, before he gets out, they're firing into the windshield of that pickup. You know, the pickup gets a big hole in the windshield. Um, Anonymous actually uh, slowed that down. Some one of the members of Anonymous recreated that video um, to where you can magnify the uh, different stages of what happened and to show who shot Lavoie Finnegan and how many times he was shot. And you can see when they do a close-up on the windshield before anybody gets out of the car, they're firing into that car and barely missing people. And in fact, shot Ryan Bundy, um, you know, before uh, Lavoy got out of the car. So the, uh, you know, premise that there was some sort of threat there is ridiculous. There was no threat there from Lavoy or from any of those protesters in that car. Um, but then to say that Lavoy went for a gun, you know, with the opposite hand he was, you know, using uh, for what he would um, typically be using uh, as a right-handed shooter, you know, to, to reach into the opposite pocket of what he would, where he would typically keep his gun doesn't make any sense. But the other thing that doesn't make any sense is they ran the serial on that 9 millimeter pistol they found, and it came back to a, a stolen gun. Like somebody bought this gun on the black market. Lavoie didn't need to buy a black market gun. He was a legitimate gun owner. He had a 45 caliber Colt uh, revolver that he left at the refuge. And he didn't need a gun. He left the, the Colt 45 um, just so that he didn't have any, you know, he wasn't displaying any threats, you know. Um, uh, Blaine Cooper um, said that, uh, that Lavoie had left the gun at the refuge. And he left his revolver there, 
and he did it specifically and intentionally before they left. Um, so what you can look up, you know, to find out what the what this is all about, why there would be a nine millimeter uh, pistol found on the boy, uh, is uh, look up drop gun because police will take a gun out of evidence to drop it on a suspect after they've shot him and killed him to excuse the murder. And that's what's happened here. I mean, they've, they've got a nine millimeter pistol that is registered as stolen and, uh, you know, is not the gun that Lavoie was known to have. And there would be no reason why he would be reaching into the wrong side of his coat to get it. You know, when, when, uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, doesn't fit his shooting style, you know, and, and it doesn't fit any logical sense why he would have that stolen gun on him. He didn't need, he was a, a, a registered gun owner. He had a registered pistol that was legal. Why would he need to put himself in jeopardy by carrying around a stolen gun when he's been threatened with arrest? It doesn't make any sense. You know, if I knew that I was defying the government and I was going to meet with the government, you know, and, you know, they were way out gunning me, you know, there's no way that I was going to use a little nine millimeter against a bunch of people with automatic weapons. You know, why would I go out and, and uh, obtain a, a stolen gun and carry it on me um, to get another felony. That would be stupid. It was just a drop gun. And then you see him grabbing his sides, you know, uh, but where you see this anonymous video, um, you can see where, you know, they're, they're shooting him. They're pointing the gun at him and they're shooting him. And then, you know, when they point the gun at him and take aim right after that, you can see him grab his side. And then the other guy shoots him and you can see the other guy, or the other uh, side get grabbed by Lavoy. And so he's grabbed both sides because he's been shot on both sides. He got shot nine times. Um, and then they had people in the front, on the side, in the back, everything. Uh, one around the corner of the other pickup uh, that came around. And, and then these people, after they've shot and killed the guy, they come out and they flip him off. You can watch this in the anonymous video. It's, it's pretty disturbing. And uh, that's the, the problem here is that the feds are instigating violence. There was a peaceful protest going on out at that refuge. They all say that, that uh, Lavoie Finnegan threatened the government that he was going to shoot him. Where? Where? That never happened. I've looked at all the videos. I've reviewed them many times. He never said that. He said that he would be more than willing to defend himself if they started, you know, uh, firing upon him, um, that he would defend himself. But he didn't even say that he would shoot him. He just said that he would defend himself. Um, but no, he did not uh, attack anybody. He just stepped out of the car like Ryan Payne did to draw the fire away from the women in the car. And they were firing on the car, so Lavoie jumped out, you know, into harm's way to draw the fire away from the car so that they weren't killing the people inside the car. The innocent 18-year-old girl and the woman, uh, Shauna Cox, that was in there, you know, he was protecting those women. That's all he was doing. Um, clearly, clearly. And, uh, you know, that, that stupid uh, gun thing that they planted on him. I would love to see, you know, why they edited that aerial video, you know, is obvious. But I would love to see their dashboard cameras and all the other video they got, too. Because they're going to have video on their persons. They're going to have videos in their dashboard cams. Obviously, they're just editing that stuff right now. They're just making a big production out of it to explain themselves and to clear themselves of, of any duty, you know, or any responsibility. Um, but... You know, and beyond all of that, I just wanted to mention one more thing um, that I've learned is that Obama actually signed an executive order in 2013 and expanded it in 2014 for a 14 million acre land grab in the western states that the BLM would be obtaining for National Park Service. And um, that was signed and in like 900,000 acres or 90,000 acres was in Texas and then the rest of it was in like California uh, Utah, ne Arizona, and Nevada, mostly Nevada. Nevada had a huge land grab going on um, based on the executive orders of Obama. And, and so this is the merits of socialism where, you know, we have a $17 trillion debt and uh, the government is continually, continuously consuming all of the land and resources and driving out private businesses and private enterprise and food production, you know, obviously this is, you know, ranchers who are creating food for us and creating independence from other nations by creating food for us. And, uh, you know, and they're out there uh, pushing these ranchers off their land and consuming land for park services and other things. And, uh, you know, it's not just Obama, clearly, you know, this has been going on for a while. They, they, they also did this to a guy named Donald Scott back in 1992, where they tried to 
take his land by offering him a really low deal, a really low offer on his land in California. It was worth something like a million or two dollars. Um, and uh, they were offering him, you know, low six figures. And he said no. And so then they accused him of growing pot on his property and they shot him in his house when they came to raid him. And in the uh, raid, no marijuana was found. Not even a smidgen, a smidgen of contraband was found. And uh, they call it civil asset forfeiture. They were going in there to find the marijuana so that they could confiscate the land for the park service. And this was proven. Like there's there's documented evidence that said that the park service was working in conjunction with the sheriff's department to get his land via a land acquisition, this Donald Scott in California. Um, and I'll post that. I wrote about it in 2010 on my website at xcannabis.com. Um, and that's what they're doing all over the place. They use civil asset forfeiture and they use um, land acquisition practices. Um, in fact, the Park Service uh, and uh, uh, BLM have a video out. Well, there's a video that they found. I think Anonymous probably found this and published it, but it's during a retirement of this uh, of this agent of this uh, you know bureaucracy. Uh, I believe it was the Park Service. And they were talking about how they had taken a, a mine, a uranium mine, that was worth something like $40 million from two old men that served in World War II. And through their practices of, of intimidation and harassment, they were able to get the land for $2.5 million, a $40 million property for a fraction of the price. And they laughed about it. And they called it theft. Like, literally, they called it theft. And I'll publish that here, too. I'll put a link here at the bottom. Um, and that's what it's that's what it's coming down to, is that uh, you know this this socialism where the government provides all of our needs and we have to be dependent on the government and you know free will and free exercise and um, you know and and uh, you know uh, uh, you know choosing our own destiny is is shunned and and you know is is forbidden. You know, and if you try to exercise your rights, they take them away from you either by force or by death. And so that's my biggest problem with this. Um, I, I think it's fascinating that this whole Mormon thing ties in together. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's uh, it's really fascinating for me being a former Mormon. But I think it's fascinating, you know, how these things connect, you know, how, um, um, you know, William S. Harney was the general at the time of these uh, Mormon wars. And then Harney County is where this next war is happening. And it happens between the federal government and the Mormons. It seems like a reoccurring theme. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they have picked on the Mormons enough between the uh, Governor Boggs extermination order back in Missouri to the uh, Mormon war uh, back in the 1850s. Uh, in Utah, and now with the ranchers that they're trying to consume all their land and, and um, you know, and acquire all their land for these government acquisitions, it, it's a dirty deal, and the government has got to, you know, be put in check. Uh, the sheriffs out in California, in fact, the, the sheriffs from the uh, county that we're from was there at this meeting uh, a couple days ago, that they discussed this, and those sheriffs are constitutional sheriffs. They care about the Constitution. They're not like old Dave Ward, who doesn't care at all about the Constitution. Um, these guys actually met and said, no, we've got to keep the feds off our land. Uh, they keep acquiring our land and setting it aside for parks. And then all these foreigners come over the border from Mexico and they grow pot and they use you know, chemicals and they destroy natural habitats and they do it on public land because it's unmonitored by anybody. You know, there's not like a... A governor, I mean, a government person out there all times watching over the land. It's it's a few and far between case in which the feds go out there to even check on the land. So it's completely unmaintained. Whereas if it was private, it would be fully maintained. But it's completely unmaintained because the public um, ownership, you know, the uh, government ownership of it, has very little oversight of this land. So they have people out there that are from Mexico in the Mexican gangs with guns, with chemicals, with, you know, they're digging, they're, they're rerouting streams, they're, you know, killing um, other species of, of plants and other habitats of creatures uh, to go out there and grow illegal drugs and then ship the money back to Mexico. I mean, the money doesn't even stay in the United States. They sell it here and then they, they send all the money back home. And, you know, El Chapo benefits from it, not our people. 
And so that's my biggest problem is, uh, you know, this is socialism, you know, and I'll show you the executive orders, what Obama has created here. If I, if I didn't have my baby in my arm sleeping, I would just uh, pull it up right here now. So I'll have to edit it in in just a minute. But uh, take a look at the bottom of this video in the description. And there's going to be a bunch of links there. And you can take a look at what I'm talking about and get it straight from the horse's mouth. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Thanks for listening. This is Ryan at Clovis.